what we're, what we're doing right now in this transitional point in, in the course is we're, we're making that transition from the kind of the, the deeper history of the evolution of this type of ruling elite in the country. Uh, we will get back to a point very close to the end of the course where we go way back to the very beginnings of the country uh, to try to determine how far back this whole issue goes. Uh, but we have been uh, primarily tracking these people from the time of the uh, end of the Civil War, the American Civil War, in the rise of the robber barons in the capitalist uh, corporations, uh, up to the point of the, the closing months of uh, World War II. And as I, uh, what, I want, what I want to do is I want to uh, focus on these activities uh, again, that are all being undertaken at the end of World War II. And then I want to come to focus on one of them, which is the creation of this Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, and, uh, and I want to refocus our attention on what the actual objectives of this kind of ruling cabal uh, have, had been, uh, all the way from that period of 1868 to 1898, where they basically generated this period uh, in American history where the American government was being the, uh, the, the dog being wagged by the tail of this, uh, of this particular elite and they were actually generating major foreign expeditionary forces uh, going into Central America and the Caribbean and other places to attempt to establish uh, imperial bases uh, for the, the corporations. Uh, and so we want to focus on that but I want to I want to uh, direct our attention again to where we were at the end of last week, this period at the, in the closing months of World War II. And uh, I want to, again, uh, just to make clear uh, what the, the ultimate mission was of the CIA when it, was, when it was set up in 1947, is to refocus on these uh, objectives of the ruling cabal uh, that had been pushing all the way up into the McKinley administration uh, in 1896 to, to 1900, that whole effort to generate imperial uh, bases around the world for the projection of U.S. military power to basically open markets for the major corporations and the businesses to get access to the strategic raw materials that were deemed by the corporations to be necessary for them to uh, generate their profits for their stockholders. Um, and that the, this, this particular activity uh, was the focus of their attention. And uh, what, I, what I pointed out is that when we, when we uh, got in, into World War I, that we, we saw that these same elements that were in behind the American government, they, they were engaged in very major business activities with Germany, uh, rebuilding Germany after World War I and using the mechanism of the reparations that had been drafted into the Versailles Treaty Agreement as a means of enriching the lenders who were a private business clients of Brown Brothers Harriman and were legal clients of the law firm of Sullivan and Cromwell to basically channel uh, billions of dollars of investments and loans into Germany to rebuild them out to be the, uh, the uh, what, what they at, at the time referred to as the bulwark against Bolshevism uh, in Europe. And remember, that this, this attitude on the part of this cabal had, had uh, taken place immediately at the end of World War I when the Bolshevik Revolution rose up in, in Russia and, uh, and uh, ousted uh, Tsar Nicholas uh, and his family and inserted the Bolshevik Revolution in charge of, of Russia in the Soviet Union. And right from that very start, uh, the Secretary of State at that time, Robert Lansing, uh, took advantage of the fact that Woodrow Wilson had suffered this massive stroke and was not really in a position of, of governing very effectively. 
and Robert Lansing as his Secretary of State stepped in and convened a repeated number of uh, meetings of the cabinet of the Wilson administration and using his power as the Secretary of State generated support for the sending of a U.S. Uh, dominated foreign military expeditionary force into uh, into the, so the Soviet Union to try to crush the Bolshevik, Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, and from that time on, they had been identifying this Bolshevik Revolution inside Russia as a potential threat to the imperial objectives uh, of this cabal that had been so successful in generating uh, more and more military operations on the part of the U.S. government uh, into both into the, the South Pacific and uh, into the, the Caribbean in Latin America. Uh, so that, that, that's the, the, uh, the state of affairs that we saw occurring at the end of World War I. And as we, we detailed their participation in generating the rise of the Third Reich to actually build itself up as this bulwark against uh, Bolshevism in, in Europe. And even when they were caught doing this, uh, after Germany had declared war on us, uh, and, the, and the efforts were made on the part of a congressional committee to identify the, uh, the criminal activities of these people, Alan Dulles, as the legal counsel for Brown Brothers Harriman and a senior partner in Sullivan and Cromwell, moved in and represented the individuals that were involved in owning these companies and things in Germany uh, and providing uh, strategic war materials to them uh, even after they declared war on the U.S., that uh, Alan Dulles uh, exercised his power and authority uh, at, from his position as legal counsel for Brown Brothers Harriman and a senior partner in Sullivan and Cromwell to conceal those assets uh, so that when the end of the war came, the, the end of, of the Second World War, they were still in positions uh, of power uh, because what these men did is after they had been caught in actually attempting to mount a military coup against Franklin Roosevelt uh, to keep him from going into the war against Germany. And once they've been caught actually providing strategic raw materials to Germany uh, during the war, uh, they, what they did is, is in sort of an effort at detente with Roosevelt, they came into the, uh, the Roosevelt administration during the war and they took positions, high positions in the State Department and Defense Department and in the newly created Office of Strategic Services to actually utilize their talents uh, in the war on behalf of the uh, American administration to basically be a peace offering uh, with them so they could then retain their positions of influence inside the American government. And uh, as, I, as we closed our discussion Last week, we were pointing out that, uh, that the things that they had done from these strategic positions inside these various departments, uh, one of the major ones w was that they facilitated the actual escape from Europe uh, of the major ranking uh, officials in the Nazi uh, government, uh, as well as high-ranking SS military officials and brought them down into, into South America, Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay, and Paraguay, et cetera, and they established a base of operations there for basically for the Fourth Reich, that they had a very clear vision that they were going to be establishing a Fourth Reich and that they will agree that they had lost the effort to establish complete control over Europe, but they were going to now move their base of operations into South America and uh, continue functioning. Uh, and the, the, the people that were behind this whole operation that were in the OSS, uh, in State Department and others, that they in fact then began to make their move to not only stop the prosecution of any of the war criminals that were caught in Europe and didn't get out, uh, but they, they also uh, they also uh, made a deal with the head of anti-Soviet intelligence in the Third Reich, Reinhard Galen, and put him in charge of the intelligence services of the new, newly founded West German nation state. 
Uh, and it, it, was from, it was from this position uh, that they created, yes? Before or after the war? Well, like before, I guess before and during, like what were they hoping to achieve? They, they, were, they were trying to uh, allow Germany to establish its dominion over Europe to prevent the Soviet Union and socialism from actually uh, gaining any foothold in Europe. Uh, and the, the German state was rabidly anti-communist. And so what they were doing is they were purging the communists and the socialists, they were actually exterminating them. Uh, and that was what they were doing. And that the, the major financiers out of the United States viewed that as good, because they didn't want their hegemony as the major economic system on the planet to be challenged. So that, that's what they were doing. And they, they went so far as, as you recall, to have Reinhard Galen from his position as the head of the, uh, the New West German intelligence, and as the chief source of anti-Soviet intelligence for all of the Western allies after World War II, is they established this academy at Oberammergau, the Anti-Communist Special Warfare Training Academy, where they trained 1,200 men over the period from 1947 all the way up to 1965. They trained 1,200 men whom they basically infiltrated into the highest ranks of the intelligence communities of all of the allied nations in the West. Uh, and that this group had a, more, a stronger allegiance to each other, as I pointed out, horizontally with each other than any one of them did vertically with the leaders of their own government. So that they had sort of a, a, shadow, a shadow government uh, actually functioning inside the intelligence agencies and that they therefore kept all of the Western intelligence agencies primarily, almost virtually exclusively, focused on anti-communism uh, in eliminating uh, not only communists and socialists, but labor organizers, democratic organizers, uh, teachers, student groups, uh, any groups that were attempting to establish an alternative source of power and authority inside any of those nation states to the major capitalist class that was in, that was in uh, those nation states. And that they, they had also included, uh, that we got to the very end of one of the classes, talking about the fact that they had established this secret uh, Anderson Trust, where they had actually taken the uh, gold and, and platinum and silver and jewels that they had uh, recovered in, in a dozen of these uh, troves of treasure in the Philippines and they did not tell the Congress about it. They did not tell the rest of the government about it. They actually put these uh, $1.2 trillion uh, of value into the hands of Brown Brothers Harriman, that the two of the major senior partners in Brown Brothers Harriman, uh, Robert Lovett uh, and, uh, and Robert Anderson, uh, were two of the three uh, trustees for this. And they used this $1.2 trillion to suppress any of the democratic socialist movements anywhere in Europe and in Japan, uh, for that matter. So we, and, and they, they used this base of operations in South America, in Argentina, in Brazil primarily, but also in Uruguay and Paraguay and Chile. They used this as the base of operations for actually physically exterminating their opponents, that they had this project called Operation Condor, that they, that they used to assassinate uh, their opponents, uh, and it was uh, based in the uh, security department of Pemex, the Mexican National Oil Company, and that they set up this major heroin trafficking operation that I talked about out of the Golden Triangle in cooperation with the Mafia, who are also rabidly right-wing anti-communists from Italy uh, in Sicily, that they, they worked with them to smuggle opium, transforming it into heroin, and bringing it into the United States through Havana, uh, working with Batista, who was the, the uh, fascist uh, dictator in, in Cuba, uh, along with Paul Halliwell, a full-time employee of the Central Intelligence Agency. And they were using a portion of the funds from this 
to supplement the, the Anderson Trust to actually finance the covert operations that they had going. And, and then they, they moved to the, the, the crown jewel of their operations at the end of the war, and that was to create a central intelligence agency to actually that these, uh, these elite aristocrats, uh, including, for example, Robert Lovett, one of the trustees of the Anderson Trust and a senior partner in Brown Brothers Harriman, uh, he actually headed up a commission. And is one of the key facts that happened here is on, on April 12th of 1945, prior to the, uh, the end of the, uh, uh, the war, even against the, in Europe, against the, the, the fascists there, uh, and before the surrender of Japan, uh, on April 12th of 1945, Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, died. And, and he was just beginning his fourth term, and his, his theretofore a kind of ineffectual vice president, uh, Harry Truman, ascended to the presidency and found himself very much at the mercy of all of the people in the OSS and the State Department and the Defense Department who were rapidly moving, one of the famous quotes they had, is, as one of them said to love it, is, is to hell with Yalta. Now that Roosevelt is dead, whatever agreements that he made with Stalin and Churchill at the end of the war, to hell with those. And what they did is they began to manipulate Harry Truman into adopting this rapidly anti-communist perspective. Uh, and began to engage in a series of covert operations to try to assemble a major network in Europe working with Reinhard Galen to attempt to neutralize uh, any levels of effectiveness of the Russian government, the new Soviet uh, government. And so that's, that's what they were doing. And they, they went so far as to, pr to establish a domestic, privately funded uh, intelligence organization that was made up of two separate private groups. One was called the Foreign Intelligence Digest out of Dallas, uh, and another one was called the Field Operations Intelligence. And they were two different uh, units that were funded by, by H.L. Hunt and William Pauley uh, and a fellow named Charles Willoughby, who was the G2 or Chief of Intelligence for Douglas MacArthur in, in the Philippines. And so we, we'd gotten to the point of my pointing out to you that the, the, Doolittle, the two major commissions that were recommending the creation of a new Central Intelligence Agency, one of them was the Lovett Commission, chaired by Robert Lovett, this senior partner of Brown Brothers Harriman, and the other one was the Doolittle Commission, uh, the principal uh, de facto chairman of which uh, was this guy William D. Pauley. And, and William D. Pauley, I pointed out to you, was an extreme right-wing fascist uh, that owned a, a series of major sugar plantations in Cuba, were, was close friends with Batista and with uh, the Santos Traficante, the head of the mafia, and was a business partner with Paul Helliwell. Uh, that these, these people funded these domestic intelligence uh, organizations. Uh, because they wanted to have them engaged in anti-subversive intelligence gathering here in the United States. At the same time that they were moving to try to get an, an absolute official agency established uh, to engage in covert operations abroad. Uh, and one of the, the principal requirements uh, of the people that agreed to set up the Central Intelligence Agency was that it not be allowed to engage in any domestic activity because they had a great fear of a political intelligence operation like this uh, if it was functioning inside the United States that it could end up attempting to establish dominion and power over the political parties in actually neutralizing the effectiveness of the government. Oh, 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 oh okay, all right. Uh, so so this, this was the situation that we, we saw obtaining in the United States when they made this move to create the Central Intelligence Agency uh, in, in that you had Robert Lovett and William Pauley and all of these people inside the OSS uh, while Bill Donovan, uh, the, the head of Do uh, Donovan Leisure, the law firm, 
You had the, the Sullivan and Cromwell, you had uh, Dylan Reed, you had Brown Brothers Harriman, you had all of these, uh, these uh, little nests where these people as part of this uh, a cabal were, were entrenched. They were all lobbying like mad against Truman to get Truman to approve the creation of this Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, and they succeeded in doing so in 1947. Uh, and the, there was a specific National Security Council directive, uh, uh, the uh, 25, not 25, the, the uh, 5412, uh, National Security Council Resolution 5412 authorized this, this new Central Intelligence Agency to, in addition to its intelligence gathering and intelligence analysis, it authorized them to undertake specific operations that were from time to time authorized by the National Security Council. And, what they, and it was clear that this was intended uh, uh, from the beginning of the Eisenhower administration at least, uh, if not under Truman. Truman was very leery of having them have any kind of covert operations authority. Uh, but the fact is that by the time uh, Eisenhower was elected in 1952, which was just five years after the agency started, that, that Eisenhower very clearly uh, understood that this agency was going to be engaging in covert uh, intelligence operations and, and paramilitary operations against not only the Soviet Union and any of its agents, but engaged in covert operations against any groups that were subversive to the governments that they had established around the world that were anti-communist and pro-fascist and pro-capitalist. In fact, they used to consistently refer to these, these uh, governments that they were putting in place as those that were friendly to the capitalist economic system. So that this was very clearly uh, the agenda and in virtually all of the documents that you see, the, the recommendations of Lovett and, uh, and Pauli and the others, that it was very clearly perceived as uh, an effort to defend the capitalist economic system, uh, of which, of course, they were some of the principal beneficiaries of that particular economic system. Uh, and so that when you, when you see the establishment of the Central Intelligence Agency, that that gave this, this group of men a, a base of operations in the United States. Even though they weren't allowed to function inside the United States, what it did is it established an agency that could work directly with the fascists that were in South America uh, as allies. And so that you, you had this, they, they, they built, a, they, the Central Intelligence Agency was originally spread out different offices in some dozen buildings around Washington, D.C. And so that they ended up proposing building one sim single centralized building for them in Langley, Virginia, just outside of D.C. And they moved there, and this was their base of operations. Uh, and they, they set up a, uh, uh, an, ancillary, an ancillary office uh, to try to, which began in 1959, uh, but I don't want to leap ahead too far because that, that becomes a major focus of our attention this period in 1959. But we're, we're at 19, 1952 when Eisenhower and, and, uh, and Richard Nixon are elected. Uh, uh, and they, they take over after the two, two uh, terms of, uh, of Truman. And they, they, come, they come to power and very, very importantly, one of the most critical steps that was taken during this entire time is uh, Alan Dulles, who was the legal counsel for Brown Brothers Harriman, uh, was made the first civilian director of the Central Intelligence Agency under the Eisenhower administration. And they set up a, 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 a subcommittee of the National Security Council, uh, which was made up of the head of the Central Intelligence Agency, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, and the heads of all four of the major military uh, services of the United States. By that time, the Air Force and the Army 
in the Navy, in the, in the Marine Corps, that they were all, they all made up a National Security Council. And what they had, they had a subcommittee of the National Security Council that was called the 5412 Committee. And the 5412 Committee was specifically uh, designated as the group that would oversee covert operations that they would initiate the covert operations, they would respond to specific requests uh, on the part of any, any agency of the government, the president uh, or the, the military services to undertake a covert operation, all directed ostensibly against the Soviet Union. Because these people, as I said, as soon as Roosevelt died, they, they moved in and had this neophyte uh, basically, Harry Truman, whom they basically buffeted around and pushed around and got him to do their bidding and got him to agree to begin immediately prior to the end of the war to focus, to refocus the activities of the Office of Special Services to counter the, the Soviet Union and to, to not only counter the Soviet Union but to counter any group, and I, I want to emphasize this, any group or organization uh, inside any of the nation states in Western culture who were in fact subversive to the fascist governments that they had installed at the end of World War II by the use of the Anderson Trust Funds and the funds that were starting to flow from the, the Golden Triangle with the heroin operations that they had going. Now, the, the, the challenge to this analysis is the fact that so many people think it's, this is so heinous and, and so criminal uh, and so, so infected with what they call scienter or specific evil intent that people find it hard to believe that it could have been going on and they didn't know about it. Uh, well, the answer to that is, is that people did know about it. The, the people that were inside the government administrations in both the, the Democratic and Republican Party did know about this. But the, the challenge was that they all agreed with it. They all agreed that what we should do is protect the capitalist system uh, against the Soviet Union and their socialist or communist system. And when, uh, when after, after the United States invaded uh, Russia in 1918, and immediately after World War II began these kind of aggressive operations uh, against them uh, that the, the Soviet Union uh, engaged in the very tragic uh, activity of uh, falling under the control of Stalin and, and replaced uh, regular Marxism uh, and Marxist-Leninism with Stalinism. And so what they did is they infected the entire uh, socialist movement with kind of an imperial authoritarian uh, dimension uh, in the Soviet Union. And what that did is it allowed propaganda to be designed by this cabal in the United States and in the West to start focusing upon those type of authoritarian activities and imperialist activities that were being fostered and promoted by Stalin uh, in Berea and the other people that they had in that, that administration. And, and so they, the, these people began to go to town here in the, in the United States, in the Central Intelligence Agency, flogging this, uh, this theory of world domination on the part of the communist regime in the Soviet Union. And this triggered this entire period that went on from 1952, all during the Eisenhower administration, uh, of this rabid anti-communist kind of red scare in the McCarthy era. That, that you've heard so much about. Uh, and Joe McCarthy, uh, a, a Republican senator from Wisconsin uh, in the United States Senate, uh, made it his uh, claim to fame that he was going to be kind of leading the charge against uh, anybody in the United States who they viewed to be subversive. It didn't require you being a communist, didn't require you being a socialist, uh, all that it required was that you were perceived by these people as being subversive to their agenda. And of course, their agenda was a pro-fascist agenda around the world. And so anyone who criticized that 
or proposed any kind of alternative uh, uh, systems of any kind were immediately targeted uh, as either communists or fellow travelers is the term that they used. And the, uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigation set up an entire division inside the FBI called Division Five, the Five Squad, uh, as they're referred to, uh, uh, hunting down people in the United States uh, that were viewed to be subversive. And they would monitor uh, the books you checked out in the libraries. Uh, they, they would uh, wiretap telephones. They would follow people around. They would infiltrate. Uh, student organizations and faculty organizations. They would infiltrate labor unions, uh, any other social group, the feminist groups that were, were advocating, uh, you know, uh, increased rights for women, uh, increased rights for, for black citizens. They would infiltrate all of these organizations and they didn't stop at simply monitoring their activities to try to determine whether or not they were subversive to the fascist agenda. What they would actually do is they would infiltrate into these organizations uh, agents provocateurs. They would actually infiltrate them and they would get inside and start cajoling these organizations to try to engage in some type of a criminal activity. Uh, and, and then they, if they could ever persuade even one or two of the people inside such an organization to do that, they would then drop this prosecutorial tent on the whole organization and they would deem it to be a subversive organization, and then the attorney general would put them on this list. They called the ADEX list, the administrative index, uh, which was that this was a subversive organization. Uh, and they would tar everybody up with that brush, and, uh, and they would keep you from being employed uh, in, in civilian uh, private businesses. They'd keep you from, of course, having any kind of position in the government. Uh, and that they would, they would keep you from getting any kind of a post at a university, a teaching position or anything. Uh, and uh, and it, was a, it, was an, it was a terrible uh, period uh, in the United States that went on during this McCarthy era. It went on virtually during the entire period of the Eisenhower administration. And one of the principal uh, forces behind all of that uh, was in fact Richard Nixon who was his vice president, who sat in the National Security Council meetings and chaired the 5412 committee. And so Nixon became a, a close compatriot uh, of the people inside the Central Intelligence Agency. And the Central Intelligence Agency set up an entire uh, division or department. It was called the Department of Policy and Plans uh, originally. They would, they would give them these kind of innocuous names so that people couldn't tell what they were doing. Uh, and there was this, the operations directorate of the, the, uh, the Office of Policy and Plans was the actual covert arm that they, that they had going. Uh, and so, so what, what, I, what I wanted to do is I wanted to make clear to you what this organization was intended right from the very beginning to do. Uh, and it, it had, it had uh, morphed all the way from being a group designed to protect the Western world against communist aggression or Soviet specific imperial aggression. And it had morphed very quickly into an organization that was designed to identify and suppress anybody who was subversive to the fascist uh, objectives of the capitalist cabal that actually was running the United States and running these governments that had been set up after World War II with funding from the Anderson Trust. Uh, and they were engaged in, a, in, a, in an absolute partnership with the mafia uh, that was involved in helping to transport the opium from Southeast Asia, from the Golden Triangle to the Corsican Mafia and into Havana, uh, to the point where, uh, where J. Edgar Hoover, who was the head of the FBI, would adamantly insist that there was no such thing as the mafia. That, that he was just adamant that there was no such thing as the, as the mafia. And he would spend 90% you know, of their time hunting subversives inside the United States who were subversive to the imperial capitalist ambitions of the people who were running the, the government. 
and would, would not, in fact, prosecute any of these people that were engaged in massive heroin smuggling, uh, gambling casinos, uh, uh, prostitution around the country, uh, 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 setting up, setting up uh, bribing systems for judges and legislators and things around the country, so that you, you had this period in the United States from uh, basically the end of the cold, the end of the uh, World War II, all during the Eisenhower administration, uh, with Richard Nixon sitting in the catbird seat of the 5412 uh, committee, uh, in which they were basically they were basically a criminal enterprise. That they were engaging in heroin smuggling, they were protecting the mafia that was engaged in a whole series of uh, criminal activities. Uh, and they would not, in fact, prosecute the mafia because if they did, the mafia could blow the whistle on them and say that, oh, you can't prosecute us because we're helping tr uh, you know, transport your heroin, which you're using to secretly finance your war uh, you know, against Mao in China uh, by, by providing uh, money and equipment to the Kuomintang, uh, the Chinese nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek. So that there was this, this extraordinarily bizarre period in American history, from 1952 up to 1959, this seven years of the eight years of the uh, of the uh, Eisenhower uh, Nixon administration, uh, and and what I, what I want to do is I want to uh, focus now on on a series of events that began to happen uh, at the at the height of that that type of uh, activity that was going on by the administration. Uh, that w what happened is that uh, in, 19, in, in 1958, all during 1958 uh, and earlier from 56 to 58, a, a movement began in Cuba uh, led by Fidel Castro, an attorney. This is another recommendation for law school. Uh, that, you know, an attorney along, along with uh, uh, Che Guevara, and uh, in Fidel's brother, uh, uh, Raul Castro, and five other major uh, commandantes that were undertaking a revolution against this fascist dictator, Batista. And Batista, as I said, was business partners with Santo Traficante, the Don of the Mafia in Havana, and business partners with, uh, with the Sea Supply Corporation and Paul Heliwell. He was partners, in effect, with the Central Intelligence Agency. And they functioned uh, in Havana as a critical link in the covert operations of the Central Intelligence Agency because they had this flow of heroin coming into Cuba and being then transported up into the United States and sold in the United States. And it was a, a major source of funding for their covert operations. And so that, so that when, when, uh, when Fidel Castro and Raul Castro and Che Guevara and the others rose up against Batista, who was in fact a total uh, authoritarian, who was you know, imprisoning people and torturing people and assassinating people, uh, all of that activity that was, that was going on, they rose up against him and they overthrew uh, Batista on New Year's Eve uh, of 1959. Uh, and uh, Batista fled from Cuba and along with Batista, all the leaders of the mafia uh, and the other fascist supporters of Batista in, in Cuba fled with them. And so there was this huge uh, uh, flight went on out of Cuba from uh, New, Year's, New Year's Eve of 1959 all the way through January and early February of 1959. You know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these uh, right, extreme right-wing pro-fascist elements and mafia people from, from Cuba, fled up out of Cuba, came the 90 miles uh, up into, into southern Florida, and they established themselves in Miami and in Tampa. And they set themselves up and they, they created a, a virtual uh, expatriate uh, uh, government uh, in, in, in Miami, in Tampa, uh, in exile against the, the, uh, the new Cuban government. The revolutionary government in Cuba. And what happened is uh, Richard Nixon, in his position as the head of the 5412 committee, uh, immediately got uh, Eisenhower to sign on to 
uh, had no trouble getting the agreement of the head of the Central Intelligence Agency, that was Alan Dulles, uh, to issue an ultimatum to Fidel Castro, uh, telling Castro that uh, if the new Cuban revolutionary government were going to be given any kind of diplomatic recognition by the United States, they would have to agree to have absolutely no diplomatic relations with either Russia, that's the Soviet Union, or China. They had to have absolutely no diplomatic relations with them whatsoever. Uh, and if, in fact, they didn't agree to do that, not only would the, the United States give the new Cuban government no diplomatic recognition, they would begin to boycott them. Uh, they would basically uh, set up a, uh, a, an embargo against Cuba, and they would attempt to destroy the economy of the, of the, Cuban, of the Cuban government. Uh, and the, that ultimatum was issued by Richard Nixon. Fidel Castro uh, told him to go pound sand uh, and that he wasn't going to abide by that. And, uh, and right away, uh, Richard Nixon from the 5412 committee began to mobilize a covert operation inside the operational directorate of the Central Intelligence Agency that was called Operation 40, was the code name for it. And it was based in Miami, uh, uh, on, the, on the campus of the University of Miami. And it wasn't disguised all that well. It was set up to operate out of this old airplane hangar uh, on the campus of the University of Miami. Uh, they assigned a number of CIA uh, trained officials uh, that had been trained at the fish farm uh, by, uh, by the Central Intelligence Agency between 1947 uh, now in 1959. They had a whole 12 years of classes that had come out. And what they did is they set up a set of paramilitary bases, uh, one of them on No Name Key, uh, this key uh, off uh, Florida, uh, another one on Swan Island, just off the coast of Florida, one of them in the Everglades of Florida, and two of them in Louisiana, one at the southern end of Lake Pontchartrain and the other at the northern uh, edge of uh, Lake Pontchartrain. And the Central Intelligence Agency's Covert Operations Directorate be began to supply military equipment, uh, trainers, military trainers uh, to, these, to these people. And, uh, and all through the latter half of 1959 and into the first half of 1960, this one year period, this Operation 40 began to function against the, the new Cuban revolutionary government. And what happened then is Richard Nixon uh, threw his hat into the ring to be the new president, the nominee of the Republican Party, because uh, Eisenhower had, uh, had, had his two four year terms from 1952 to 1956 and from 1956 to 1960. Uh, and the constitutional amendment had been passed limiting presidents to two terms, which in fact didn't exist before that. Uh, and, and as you, as you saw that, that uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had, was elected to four terms uh, and they, they, they got the, the constitutional amendment passed limiting the president to two terms. And so Eisenhower at the end of his two terms uh, had to leave office in 1960, so Richard Nixon announced his candidacy for the Republican nomination. And, uh, and there was a major contest going on in the Democratic Party for the Democratic Party nomination. Uh, Adlai Stevenson was competing for the nomination. He had lost twice to Eisenhower. Uh, and this young senator from Massachusetts, uh, John F. Kennedy, uh, announced his candidacy as well for the Democratic Party nomination. The principal contest going on inside the Republican Party for the nomination was between, uh, uh, was between Richard Nixon and, uh, and uh, Nelson Rockefeller. Uh, and there were efforts to get Henry Cabot Lodge to, to compete as well. Uh, so that this activity was going on throughout the first half of 1960 uh, during which Operation 40 was in full swing uh, going against the island of Cuba. And what, they, what the CIA did is out of that base of Operation 40 on the campus of the University of Miami, uh, they were recruiting 
right-wing pro-fascist uh, Cuban exiles that had fled from Cuba uh, and members of the mafia. And that they were mafia people, mafia gunmen, uh, extreme right-wing Cuban exiles, and uh, a number of all Cuban organizations began to form. Uh, the 506 Brigade, uh, the 2506 Brigade, they had about a half a dozen of these rabidly anti-communist, pro-fascist, uh, kind of authoritarian uh, uh, private organizations uh, sprung up all around Miami uh, and Tampa. And, uh, and they were ripe recruiting grounds for Operation 40. And so Operation 40 had like over a thousand uh, people working for it. Uh, and they were engaged in these paramilitary strikes against uh, the island of Cuba from these five paramilitary bases, uh, each one of which had a CIA liaison officer working directly with them, uh, training them and helping to supply the military equipment, helping to make plans for them, uh, etc., and actually going on missions with them and in some instances. And they would like uh, blow up bridges, They'd, they'd sneak into uh, Cuba, they'd go down in the boats across the 90 miles, uh, and then they would, would go in, uh, uh, go ashore, and they'd blow up bridges, and they'd uh, set fire to entire fields of sugar cane. They would poison uh, uh, shipments of sugar that had been put on ships to go to Russia. They would poison the, the sugar, hoping to poison people in the, the Soviet Union and, have it, and disrupt any relationships uh, with, with Cuba. Uh, so this whole operation had been going on for the better part of a year uh, from the middle of 1959 after, after, uh, uh, after Fidel Castro rejected the ultimatum that had been put to him by Nixon and the Eisenhower-Nixon administration. And, uh, and so that the, the campaign uh, started moving into high gear in both, uh, in both parties. And in, uh, in June of 1960, uh, uh, Nelson Rockefeller withdrew from the Michigan primary. Uh, what we, ha we have tonight, for, so we have the Indiana primary tonight, uh, where the big contest is, uh, is between, is, and the Republican side is basically between Trump and, uh, and Cruz, and, uh, and everybody's sort of recognizing that if Cruz loses tonight, then he'll have to have one more desperate effort wherever the next place is where he thinks that if he can just win that one, maybe he can survive. Obviously what Cruz is doing is hoping that, uh, that, that Trump is going to somehow self-destruct between now and the time of the convention in Cleveland and that he'll become a, a non-viable candidate for the, for the Republican Party and that they'll have to turn to Cruz as having the second highest number of, of delegates. Uh, and Kasich is hanging in there uh, with only like 140 some delegates now. Because, because he, he keeps on polling the highest of any of the Republican uh, vote getters, any of them that have any delegates at all, uh, who will do the best against Hillary Clinton in a head-to-head -head contest in the general election. So they're both hanging around, Cruz and, and, and Kasich, uh, but, but Trump is probably going to beat, uh, beat Cruz by 10 points uh, in Indiana tonight. And, uh, and effectively eliminate Cruz as a viable candidate unless Trump self-destructs by the time of the convention. So it doesn't make any difference to Cruz, you know, how few delegates he gets tonight or how badly he's beaten. He's going to just keep on smiling. You know, it, it's like the, the guy in the money Python, Python thing where he keeps getting his legs cut off and stuff and he keeps on challenging. It's an old, old saw. But the, the, but the, the, the basic thing, and, and tonight, you know, they're, they're, we're going to be in the, in the Democratic side. We're going to have Hillary Clinton against Bernie Sanders. And as of right now, it's around 8 to 10 points uh, with, uh, with Hillary favored to win by 8 or 10 points. Uh, if it gets closer than that, uh, if it gets into the single digits, then uh, Bernie is going to get just about the same number of delegates uh, out of Indiana as Hillary does. But for every, every advantage she gets of any two or three or four more delegates that she gets in a split decision in any state, she picks up more of a lead on him going in toward the, toward the convention. And so the, he, as you know, has shifted now into his position of advocating that he gets as many 
delegates as possible so he can have maximum influence on the party platform at the convention. All of that is just to put it into the current context of our, of our gathering here today. But back in June of 1959, uh, the, this event happened where Nelson Rockefeller withdrew from the, the, the Republican presidential primary in the state of Michigan. And upon that withdrawal, Richard Nixon knew that he was going to win the Republican nomination. And he was convinced that, uh, that whether, whether John F. Kennedy or Stevenson or whoever it is that won the Democratic nomination, that they weren't gonna have a chance against him. He'd been the, the Vice President of the United States for, you know, for uh, eight years, had been the United States uh, uh, Senator, uh, had been the, uh, the Congressman from California. He thought that he was gonna win. So what he did is he reached out in a, in a, in a secure telephone conversation uh, in June uh, through the NSC, a 5412 committee, he contacted Howard Hughes, who had become a, a classified uh, resource person for the National Security Council uh, following his invention of the spruce goose. There's this big long thing, you can look it up. But anyway, uh, he was this rather brilliant guy and a, and a major adventurous uh, aviator and he designed and built the prototype of the C-5A cargo plane called the Spruce Goose, this gigantic cargo plane made out of spruce wood. Uh, and he showed that this gigantic, uh, almost like ocean liner sized airplane could actually fly. And he, he flew it and the, the people were all telling him he was crazy. This was before he was crazy. And, uh, and, uh, and so he, he got fed up with them all and, uh, and basically gave them the finger and walked off the, the public stage, which he was quite prominent on, not unlike Donald Trump. He was a big bravado guy that, uh, you know, that owned, a, bought a studio in Hollywood and married uh, Hollywood uh, actresses and, uh, you know, cruised around in Las Vegas and did all these crazy things. Uh, and uh, and he, he got so upset at the way the media treated him over his designing and building of this uh, C-5A cargo plane, uh, that he basically left the public eye and he became a secret uh, resource for the National Security Council. And he created this company called the Summa Corporation uh, in which he, he built technology uh, for the National Security Council to undertake covert operations, one of which was the Glomar Explorer uh, that uh, was a, a huge ocean-going vessel that was capable of reaching all the way down to the bottom of the ocean uh, in picking up a damaged Russian submarine uh, if one happened to occur and that they could recover the Russian submarine and bring it aboard and then get at all the secret technology in the, in the, Soviet, uh, machine, the Soviet submarine and a number of other major covert operations the sensitivity of which was extraordinary, uh, I will tell you, because I've become aware of what some of them were that he was doing with him, but it doesn't do you any good to know those things right now. Uh, but, but the bottom line is he had developed this extraordinarily sensitive position with the National Security Council. And so what happened is Richard Nixon uh, in June of 1960, after realizing that he was going to become the nominee for the Republican Party, he gets on this, the, the secret telephone uh, and he contacts Howard Hughes on his version of the telephone and tells Howard Hughes that Richard Nixon wants to have an assassination team put together. Uh, and he wants Howard Hughes to do this so that it will keep it away from the president, referring to himself. Uh, he began to refer to himself as the president in the third person, much like Donald Trump refers to himself as Donald Trump, uh, and, uh, and so he said that, the, that I, I wanna have this assassination team put together and uh, I wanna keep it away from the president uh, and I want the team to assassinate Fidel Castro, Raul Castro, Che Guevara, and the other five commandantes uh, of the new Cuban revolutionary government. Uh, and, uh, but I don't want to hear anything more about it. <clears throat> and and uh, in the telephone call, Howard Hughes did not agree to do this or disagree with him. He just listened to him 
And after hanging up, uh, Howard Hughes then calls in to his office in Las Vegas. Uh, that uh, it was, I think the, it was either the Sands Hotel. I think he had the, the whole top floor that he bought the Sands Hotel. Uh, and he was living in the top floor of the big penthouse suites. And he called, he called uh, uh, Robert Mayhew, one of his new young lawyers, in and told Mayhew that the president, uh, the president getting ready to be president, Richard Nixon, uh, which they all assumed was going to happen, that he was going to get elected, wants to have us put together this assassination team uh, and wants to have it kept away from the White House. Uh, and so I'm tasking you with getting this done. And so uh, Bob Mayhew, uh, the lawyer for Howard Hughes, reached out there in Las Vegas to, uh, to uh, Johnny Roselli, uh, and Johnny Roselli was the bag man in Las Vegas uh, to the Flamingo Hotel and the, another couple of them that the mob owned there. Uh, and he was the bag man for Sam Giancana. Sam Giancana was the Don of the Mafia in Chicago, uh, second in power only to Santos Traficanti, who was the Don in Havana that sat astride this heroin trafficking that they had going on for the CIA uh, and themselves. And so, uh, so Johnny Roselli, after a second meeting with Bob Mayhew, this one out in California at the Brown Derby, actually, where they met, and then they had a, a secret meeting, and, uh, and uh, Sam Giancana uh, was contacted by, uh, by Bob Mayhew uh, and his, his bag man, Johnny Roselli, and they came to, from California, they went to Chicago, and they sat down with Sam Giancana, uh, Bob Mayhew, and, uh, and Johnny Roselli, and they pitched this proposal to him from the president, they kept referring to Nixon as. And, uh, and Sam Giancana stated that he was not opposed in principle to doing this, uh, because as, as, uh, Sam, as uh, Bob Mayhew pointed out to them, you guys, use guys, that's how they refer to them, use guys, uh, you know, have your own reasons for wanting to get rid of these SOBs, you know, down there in Cuba. They've closed down all your casinos. They've closed down your heroin trafficking operation. They've closed down all your houses of prostitution. You know, you've got your own reason for wanting to get rid of them. So would you do this? <clears throat> and so they sit down and they have this conversation in Chicago. And Sam Giancana says, look, I'm not opposed to doing this. Uh, but this is, if we do this, uh, kill uh, Castro, the Castro brothers and Che Guevara and the others, that's down in Santos Traficante's territory. So he has to consent to this. Uh, and so they fly down uh, and they have, a, they have a series of three meetings at the Fontainebleau Hotel in, uh, in late June and early July of uh, 1960. And uh, in the third meeting, uh, uh, Sam Giancana ends up persuading uh, uh, Santos Traficante in principle that he'll agree to do this. But he said he wants to make sure that Santos Traficante wants to make certain that this isn't some pipe dream uh, of Howard Hughes or even worse yet, Robert Mayhew. Uh, he wants to make sure that this is coming from Nixon. So he insists upon having someone come to the next meeting and give them the green light to go ahead and do this. And in the, the third and final meeting, a man shows up at the, uh, at the third meeting using the, the code name Mr. Ed, and it turns out it's Sheffield Edwards. And Sheffield Edwards is the chief of security for the Central Intelligence Agency uh, under Richard Nixon and as the vice president and chair of the 5412 committee and under Alan Dulles. And they, uh, and, and, uh, uh, Sheffield Edwards gives them the green light to go ahead and do this. So they set up the uh, assassination team in, uh, in Santos Traficante, as he said to us <laughs> later uh, in May of 1973, when we were talking with him about this, actually through our chief investigator at the, at the Bailey firm, of whom he was a client. Uh, he said, that, look, you know, I didn't fall off no melon wagon, he said. And so what I decided I was going to do is in putting this assassination team together, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select a number of my former gunmen out of Havana that were there to protect our casinos and our houses of prostitution and the heroin trafficking who have now been recruited by the Central Intelligence Agency down in Miami 
to be part of Operation 40. So what I'm gonna do is put together the assassination team made up of 15 of these uh, anti-Castro Cuban exiles uh, who are part of Operation 40, but who are my guys, really. Uh, and so he did. So he puts together this 15-man uh, team uh, that he, they codenamed the S Force. S is in Sam. Uh, and they, they, uh, they put together the S Force uh, of 15 people, and they were made up of guys like, uh, like Rafael Chichi Quintero and Ricardo, uh, uh, was it? Ricardo Chavez, in the, the Villa Verde brothers, or a whole bunch, we got their names, there's 15 of the guys, okay? And they put them all together, and they're all spread out, actually, in these five paramilitary camps uh, that have been operating as Operation 40. Uh, and so there are like two or three of them in each one of these places, but they're spread all around. And so what happens is they send a private plane to get them, and they will then fly them together, they fly them to Fort Huachuca, in Arizona, uh, and at Fort Huachuca, they sign in at Fort Huachuca, and then they just disappear. And it turns out that they were brought by private plane from Fort Huachuca, flown down into Mexico, into Oaxaca, Mexico. And they, they land there at a landing strip that's at the a ranch of a fellow by the name of Clint Merchinson, uh, Clint Merchinson Jr., actually. Uh, and his father, Clint Murchison Sr., is the one who owns the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, at that time, it was called the Dallas Texans. Uh, but the, uh, and they also own the uh, Santa Anita racetrack in California, which is where J. Edgar Hoover uh, and Clyde, whatever his name is, uh, who was his friend uh, and deputy director of the FBI, used to go and spend uh, long weekends together uh, and be given free, uh, free betting on the horses uh, at Santa Anita. Uh, and so that this, this ranch that exists down in Oaxaca, Mexico, uh, they, they fly them down there and they have a triangular fire team base training facility there at the ranch. Uh, and these 15 men are trained in triangular crossfire assassinations with high-powered rifles uh, to assassinate uh, the uh, Raul Castro and Fidel Castro and Che Guevara and the others. And that activity is going on. And the way that it's financed, this is all given to us by Santos Traficante, who set the whole thing up, tells us all about it. And that what they would do is they would skim the cash, uh, skim cash off the uh, casinos in Vegas that were owned by the mob. Uh, they would skim the cash off and they would put this cash in these very expensive uh, suitcases, and then they would put the suitcases into the trunk of these, uh, of these uh, uh, Cadillac, brand new Cadillac automobiles, and they would drive them from Las Vegas all the way through New Orleans, and then into Miami. And they would deposit the cash in the Miami National Bank, which is the national bank that's owned uh, by Meyer Lansky who is the treasurer for the mafia. And they put the money in the banks, and then they would wire the money to the International, uh, International Credit Bank in Geneva, Switzerland, owned by this guy by the name of Guyon. Uh, and that they would put the money, in, they would wire the money into the bank, and then they would wire portions of the money to different places. And one of the places that they would wire part of the money to was into the Banco Internacional in Mexico City and they would put the money, wire it into this account of an attorney by the name of Ogario uh, down in Mexico City, and that's where they were funding the activities of the Triangular Fire Team Base out of Oaxaca, Mexico. Uh, and that whole operation was uh, underway uh, in the second half of 1960, uh, and the campaign was then going on. Nixon did get the nomination for the Republican Party, and John F. Kennedy got the nomination for the Democratic Party, and they, they went on into the fall, into October, uh, and then they had the television debates, the now famous uh, two debates, the first ever uh, televised presidential debates uh, in American history. And during those debates, uh, prior to the debates, Kennedy, as the nominee for the Democratic Party, had been briefed 
uh, on some of the things that were going on uh, so that he wouldn't accidentally step on any of these covert operations uh, in his campaign debates. But he got on national television and he confronted Richard Nixon, uh, challenging Richard Nixon in two very specific ways. One, he said that the Nixon uh, Eisenhower administration had allowed the United States to fall behind in the number of nuclear missiles that we had as compared to Russia. Completely untrue, but did it anyhow, uh, Trump-like fashion. Uh, just kind of said, you know, you've allowed us to fall behind and there's this missile gap. We're, we're, we're suffering this missile gap. We're behind the Soviet Union in, in nuclear missiles. And secondly, you are allowing this communist regime right down in Havana, 90 minutes from our shores, to have a communist regime there, and you're not doing anything to get rid of them. Which was another complete and total lie, because he knew perfectly well that they had Operation 40 running against them, but Richard Nixon couldn't say anything about it. And so he humiliated Richard Nixon on national television, basically charging Richard Nixon with being soft on communism, right? And, and, and made Nixon furious uh, about what he had done. But all that did is made him sweat more and made him look worse on television, uh, as it turns out. Uh, and so Kennedy ends up winning, theoretically, uh, setting aside the issue of the votes in Chicago. Uh, that, uh, that there's some serious question about. Uh, but the bottom line is, is that Kennedy ends up beating Richard Nixon uh, by the, the smallest margin, one of the smallest margins in American political uh, presidential history. And, uh, and then ascends the presidency. And, uh, and when, he, when he becomes president, he is briefed for the first time that there is a dimension of Operation 40 that he had not been told about. And that was that there was a plan afoot that as soon as Richard Nixon was to have been elected president, he was going to authorize the Central Intelligence Agency and the anti-Castro Cuban exiles that were manning these five paramilitary bases in southeastern United States. He was going to authorize them to stage an invasion uh, of Cuba, that they were going to go ashore at a place called the Bay of Pigs, uh, and they were going to go ashore and they were going to immediately hoist a flag of the free Cuban government and the Richard Nixon administration was going to give diplomatic recognition to that new government of Cuba and then they were going to send in the United States Marines uh, behind them to overthrow, uh, militarily overthrow the government, uh, the revolutionary government of Fidel Castro and Raul Castro and Che Guevara. That was what the plan was. But, uh, but when Kennedy was elected, uh, he refused to go along with that. He refused to allow any United States military forces to be deployed against the island of Cuba. Now this, is, this sounds like it would be a perfectly logical and appropriate thing for him to do, but the fact of the matter is, as General Smedley Butler pointed out in the readings that you read, uh, that the United States had in fact deployed U.S. military forces into Latin America and into the Caribbean, you know, two dozen times in the previous hundred years. And so that it wasn't anything extraordinary that, uh, that the Central Intelligence Agency and this clique of people, uh, this, uh, this cabal that was instrumental in creating the Central Intelligence Agency and putting together this entire paramilitary operation it was functioning on behalf of their interests, they thought. But here's this guy, uh, John Kennedy, who basically takes this kind of self-righteous position that he's not going to allow any U.S. military forces to be directly deployed against the island of Cuba. And so uh, Alan Dulles, the head of the Central Intelligence Agency, and Richard Bissell and a number of others who were in the Miami station, uh, they tell him, well, look, Here's what's, here's what's going to happen is, as soon as we land our 300, 400 guys uh, on the beach uh, and announce the new free Cuban government, all the people of Cuba are going to rise up against Fidel Castro in this revolutionary government. Uh, they're going to rise up and they'll overthrow uh, the government. And so Kennedy says to them, fine, fine, if that's, if that's what your assessment is as the CIA, 
then you, you go ahead and do what you were going to do, and you put these 400 guys ashore, and if the people rise up and overthrow the government of Fidel Castro, uh, once it's established, we'll recognize it. Uh, but what happens is the, the plan all along on the part of the Central Intelligence Agency, Alan Dulles, uh, in, the, in the deputy director, uh, in Bissell, the, the station uh, guy down in, in Miami, what they had intended to do is they were going to go ashore uh, and then what they were going to do is completely contrary to the direct orders of Kennedy. They were getting the commander of the Guantanamo mili Naval Military Base down in Guantanamo to actually send out naval ships to place them just offshore of, of Cuba and manned with United States Marine Corps guys. And what they were going to do is they were going to go ashore and uh, assuming that they were going to get their butt kicked, you know, if they got caught, then they were going to confront Kennedy and say, look, you've got to turn the Marines loose to save face because you're going to be humiliated because our guys are all going to get their butt kicked, you know, and you're going to be responsible for it. And they planned to trap Kennedy into having to do this. And so what happened is on, uh, I guess, April... 17th, I think it was, uh, April 17th of 1961, uh, just after he came into office. He's, he's sworn into office on January 21st of 1961. This launches on April 17th. And, uh, and what happened is, it's, it's one of the great fiascos of the many of all time. But the, the bottom line is that they had these two great big uh, bombers that were based down in Nicaragua. Uh, with Anastasio Somoza the, down in Nicaragua. And they were scheduled to, to leave Nicaragua and fly and be available so when the, these 400 guys went ashore at the Bay of Pigs, they'd have air cover in case they were discovered. And then they could take out any of the artillery and stuff that was there. But the problem was that they were in a different time zone. And they got there an hour late. That's true, you know? And so all kinds of people in history, totally ignorantly, kind of conflate the fact that Kennedy refused to give them any official U.S. air cover, which he did. They conflate that with the fact that he allegedly stood down the air cover for them and allowed them to get trapped on the beach, which is not true at all. Uh, they just screwed up and got the wrong time zone and got there an hour late, and by the time they arrived, those guys had had the crap kicked out of them on the beach. They sank their, their munitions ships. Uh, they lost all their additional ammunition and their explosives. And they were trapped on the beach. And they were getting hammered. And so what Alan Dulles and in in Bissell and the other guys from the agency did, they went to Kennedy that night at a, a gala affair that was going on at the White House. And Kennedy, in order to maintain the pretense that he had nothing to do with this, they're going on. He was attending this gala at the White House. And so they come to the gala and they pull him aside and they say, look, something terrible has happened. You know, our planes have uh, not gotten there to provide the air cover. We're getting the crap kicked out of us. You're going to be humiliated. You need to send in the Marines who were, in fact, sitting in these ships, completely contrary to Kennedy's orders, just offshore. And so Kennedy said, absolutely not. I told you that I wasn't going to do this. You're not going to get away with this. You know, you're not going to you know, extort me into having to do something I told you I wasn't going to do. And so he absolutely refuses to allow the Marines to be sent ashore. And fortunately, as history would have it, these people did not feel adequately empowered to give the order to send in the Marine Corps, which they could conceivably have done because they already defied the president by ordering them out of Guantanamo and, and stationing the ships right there. Uh, and they were staged and ready to go with fully, you know, full ammunition packs and everything ready to go. And we talked with the guys who were involved in it. Uh, and so Kennedy stands them down and the guys all get trapped on the beach. Uh, and Kennedy and everybody is humiliated. Uh, they're all taken, like almost half of them were killed. And the other 200 guys suddenly were taken captive by, by Fidel, marched them into Havana and imprisoned them. Uh, and, uh, and Khrushchev went ape and, uh, and started ranting about how the United States was an imperial power, you know, dog bites man. You know, the, the United States is, a, is an imperial power and they've tried to invade Cuba and the president is incompetent. And, you know, it was a big, 
humiliating event that took place. And Kennedy came forward and, and held a public press conference accepting responsibility for the failure uh, and uh, apologized to Khrushchev and gave Khrushchev his personal word of honor that he would stand down any further paramilitary operations against the island of Cuba, which was a big fat lie. Uh, he did not do that. Uh, all he did is change the code name from Operation 40 to Operation Mongoose. Uh, and then bolstered the number of people that were at uh, the base. It, uh, it, they called, the code name was for J.M. Wave. It's J slash M Wave, W-A-V-E. J.M. Wave, uh, what became the major uh, airplane hangar on the campus at the University of Miami, and they added more, more the CIA personnel to it, and they continued the operations against the island of, uh, against the island of Cuba. And, uh, and what happened is, is that, that was in the end of 1961. And so within a year, from October of 1961 to all the way into October of 1962, what happened is uh, uh, Nikita Khrushchev was so pissed off over the fact that this young punk had lied to him and put him into a position of temporarily at least relying upon his word that he was going to stop, stand down from any further paramilitary operations. Khrushchev got so angry, he started sending in Russian missiles into Cuba to base them in Cuba secretly so that if the United States ever mount, tried to mount another paramilitary attack against the island, he would notify them that they had missiles and that they would launch them. Uh, the, the Cuban military people, actually with Soviet technicians operating the missiles, uh, that they would launch them against the United States to stop them from any further deterrence. Uh, and the problem is that they were waiting, uh, it, it was, they, they were waiting until some big famous day, Lenin's birthday or something, uh, in the Soviet Union to let it be known. And so they were building these, these missiles and uh, the U-2 overflights over the island of Cuba picked up the, the construction of these missile bases uh, in October, in early October, uh, and they, they finally confirmed that this was for real, that these, they were putting in nuclear missiles into Cuba. And there's, a, there's a, a, an excellent movie, actually. There's a mediocre movie and then an excellent movie. The excellent movie is, is called The Missiles of October. Uh, and you can find that on the internet, I'm sure. And William Devane uh, plays uh, Kennedy, and, uh, and uh, Marty Sheen plays uh, Bobby Kennedy. And it's, it's an extraordinary uh, recreation of the events of that week uh, of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And the actors, uh, who are all men, because uh, they had all the cabinet members and the secretaries of defense and everybody else were all men at that time. And they have people playing the actual people that look almost just like them. You know, they're almost identical to them. Uh, and, the, and the, you know, they've got Bob McNamara and, uh, and, uh, uh, and Bobby, of course, and they've got, uh, um, uh, well, anyway, they're all, they're all there. That, and, and it's well worth seeing. I mean, if you want to see the dramatic account of what was going on, but the most important event uh, of that week uh, and I've, I've talked to you about this before, but it bears repeating, is that I think it was on October 18th, the night of October 18th, during that day, Kennedy had issued an ultimatum, uh, a publicly uh, expressed ultimatum to Khrushchev, uh, saying that he was drawing a line along a particular line of uh, latitude uh, between the, the island of Cuba and the open sea uh, of the Atlantic, and if any additional Russian ships crossed that line of latitude bearing any missiles to, on their way to Cuba, the, a, a technical state of war would exist between the United States and the Soviet Union. In that night of uh, October 18th, uh, a ship bearing, a Russian ship bearing missiles did in fact approach the line and cross the line. And what happened is, uh, is Curtis LeMay who was not the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, that was uh, General Lemonser, but the Air Force Chief of Staff, uh, Curtis LeMay, uh, 
mobilized the United States Air Force, and I've told you this before, and ordered the American B-52s bearing nuclear uh, payloads to the fail-safe points all around the outside borders of the Soviet Union and ordered a U-2 overflight of the Soviet Union, which is the last signal that they're going to launch an attack because what that U-2 missile, uh, U-2 overflight does is locates all of the missile silos uh, and, and broadcasts that information to the B-52s so they can put in their final targeting objectives. And so, and, and Curtis LeMay ordered all of the United States military forces to DEFCOM 2, which is the, sta the stage just below uh, uh, a shooting war. Uh, and he did all of that without the authorization of President Kennedy. And, uh, and then they convened the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff and they all voted unanimously because of the defiance of the, the uh, order from Kennedy that they not be allowed to cross the line and because Kennedy had publicly announced that if they crossed the line, we would be in a technical state of war. They actually conducted themselves as mil trained military people, that they trained themselves uh, to say that we were at, in a state of war. And so they voted unanimously to launch a full-scale military strike against the island of Cuba with full realization that it would result in the launching of nuclear missiles against the United States, which is what, which is what Curtis LeMay wanted, as it turns out. Because Curtis LeMay was convinced, and I've told you this before, Curtis LeMay, Cur, no, me, yes, Cur, Curtis LeMay said that you know, if in fact we have the nuclear war and they launch everything they've got and we launch everything we've got, if at the end we have two men standing and they have only one, we win. That, that, that's his famous quote, you know? And so when, when, uh, when they voted to go to a, a full-scale military invasion of the island of Cuba, uh, the Kenny O'Donnell, uh, the chief of staff for, for John Kennedy, came to Kennedy and told him what they had done. And Kennedy said, I will not be the man that does this. And he ordered them all to stand down from DEFCOM 2. And he ordered them all to stand down. Uh, and he ordered them to remove the US missiles from Turkey, uh, which were part of a, a demand that was being made by Khrushchev as a condition for them withdrawing the, the missiles from, uh, from Cuba. And, uh, and, uh, and there was this really famous incident that occurred where the, the offer that was made by Khrushchev asking them to remove the missiles from Turkey and he would consider removing the missiles from Cuba, when that letter got sent to the, to the US by, by teletype, uh, they were, all of our people were considering it because it was nighttime uh, in Russia and it was, it was daytime here and they were evaluating this when they received a a stronger uh, position from Khrushchev withdrawing his offer and, and, and taking this extremely militant, aggressive stand. And you'll see it in the, if you, if you do see the missiles of October, you'll see that what happened is Bobby Kennedy said they were trying to figure out what to do because it was quite clear that the, hard, the, the hardliners inside the Kremlin had somehow gotten at Khrushchev and forced him to withdraw his more conciliatory offer and, and came up with this kind of hard-nosed uh, set of demands. And so what Bobby Kennedy recommended is that they just ignore the second message. They just ignored it and they sent a reply to his previous softer offer and they agreed to accept it by withdrawing the missile, American missiles from Turkey uh, in exchange for this and it resolved the confrontation. And so they all, they all breathed a sigh of relief, they stood back. But they, if all, all it would have required is Kennedy giving a nod of, of his head. And the US Joint Chiefs of Staff were ready to launch a full-scale invasion against Cuba and launch a nuclear, uh, nuclear war with the Soviet Union. And that so traumatized uh, President Kennedy uh, that I personally believe, based on all the information that I've gotten on this, is that he went through this experience that is referred to in theological terms as a metanoia, a metanoia experience. It's this kind of total trauma 
where you're confronted with the stark dimensions of reality and it totally transforms your entire worldview. And uh, since he was then confronted in that moment uh, as the man who had the authority to basically destroy the world, uh, and he chose to stand down from that. Uh, and what he did is he not only ordered them to stand down from DEFCON 2 and ordered them to take, out, take the U.S. missiles out of Turkey, but what he also did is he ordered the opening of a back channel to Castro to normalize relations with Cuba, and he began a series, uh, and I, I mentioned this to you too quickly in passing, but uh, this contexts it now, is that he engaged in the exchange of some 18 uh, letters, totally confidential letters with Khrushchev, uh, in, in which he and Khrushchev began to have a discussion in these letters to disassemble all of the warheads uh, of the United States and all of the nuclear warheads of the Soviet Union and disassemble the missiles and, and, and stand them down. Uh, and in, the, in those letters, uh, Kennedy was proposing and Khrushchev had accepted to have uh, Pope John the 23rd be the broker of this agreement, that he would be the one to make certain that the Soviet Union complied with this and that the United States complied with it. Uh, and uh, when, uh, when, and then immediately, fought, that was all completely secret that was going on. But what Kennedy did uh, is he then ordered all five of the paramilitary bases that were being coordinated by the Central Intelligence Agency, now under the secret rubric of Operation Mongoose, he ordered all of them to stand down and totally prohibited any further paramilitary operations against the island of Cuba, which he had professed to have ordered earlier uh, after the Bay of Pigs. But now he did the genuine article and he ordered uh, them to stand down from paramilitary operations and he, uh, and he ordered them to disassemble those bases. Uh, and what happened, and that is in uh, late October, this whole process went on during November where he was ha having these negotiations with Khrushchev and then in, in, uh, he ordered them to stand down and the, the paramilitary base that was on uh, No Name Key that was under the command of CIA officer Frank Sturgis, uh, that he in fact mounted up his anti-Castro Cuban exiles and launched an attack against the island of Cuba in complete defiance of President Kennedy. And in fact, sank a Russian ship sitting in the harbor, in Havana Harbor. Uh, and it was a, it was a terrible uh, experience. It was a horrendously dangerous situation because Khrushchev, having been lied to by Kennedy once before, was now in a position of having gone to those great lengths of carrying on these secret, uh, intimate uh, negotiations with Kennedy. And then it gave the appearance of the fact that Kennedy had not been capable of standing down his own military people. Uh, and so Kennedy, uh, Bobby and John mounted a, uh, a major paramilitary operation against uh, uh, No Name Key. And they, they sent in uh, five helicopter gunships manned by, uh, by United, States United States Marshals uh, uh, to be, because they were, because Kennedy didn't trust the CIA, didn't trust the military, uh, because they were all part of this group that wanted to have this war. And so he, he used US Marshals. Uh, and sent them into uh, No Name Key, and they burnt out the entire base. Uh, and they arrested those people that had been involved in that paramilitary assault and charged them with violations of the Federal Neutrality Act, which is making war, in effect, on a nation state with whom the United States has positive diplomatic relations, <clears throat> and held them in custody for two days uh, and then released them. Uh, figuring that that was a basic shot across the bow to all the rest of the paramilitary bases, making clear that they better stand down pursuant to the president's order. But then the group that was at, in the Everglades that was under the command of CIA liaison officer E. Howard Hunt uh, 
uh, started to mount up a second paramilitary attack against the island of Cuba. Uh, and Bobby and John sent in the helicopter gunships with the U.S. Marshals again and burnt out the base and arrested them and charged them again with violation of the Neutrality Act and put them in jail. And the, the people that were part of the paramilitary operations were so furious at Kennedy that they viewed him to be a traitor because he had in fact given them authorization to engage in these types of activities. And in fact, after the Bay of Pigs debacle, uh, after he'd apologized and taken responsibility for this to Khrushchev, he, Kennedy, actually went down to Miami uh, and went to the Orange Bowl uh, and convened almost all the people in the Cuban American community down there at the Orange Bowl and in the middle of the night publicly apologized to them uh, for having let them down at the Bay of Pigs uh, earlier in April of 1961. And he promised, gave them his word, that the, the flag of a free Cuba would fly above the island before the end of his second term. So he had given them that kind of an intimate word of his. And here now, simply because they were threatening to blow up the entire world, he had changed his mind and had decided that he wasn't going to uh, continue to do that. And he genuinely ordered them to stand down and had gone to the lengths of arresting them for continuing to try to do those things that he had previously ordered them to do. And so they, of course, not surprisingly, uh, resolved that they wanted to kill him. Okay, and so that 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 brings us to the end of our the the the, the this presentation, and it leaves us 15 uh, minutes of additional time because uh, I'm going to try to be better here in the second half and not talk for the entire period of time and and give you guys a chance to ask some questions. But let me quickly uh, give you some. Leads on this. They, you, you received the little email from Noah about the quote prompt uh, for the papers. Okay, so so you, I, there may be some questions about that, but that's that's the thing that I think will be helpful for you guys. If you if you think in terms, I mean, some of you are seniors, some of you are juniors, some of you are, are earlier in your educational process here, but the, to the extent to which you have any type of a uh, an idea as to what it is that you would like to do professionally af after you've gone to graduate school and law school. Um, that, uh, that when you get done doing that, you know, what it is you'd like to do professionally. Uh, and this, this developed in my conversation with a few of you uh, uh, following on your first papers because I thought that this would be something that could engage you genuinely and substantively on this thing is that if you think in terms of what it is you want to do professionally, to reflect upon what it is that you've learned in the course, in this first half of the course, basically, uh, and, and uh, say what is it that you've learned here in the first half of the course that has some effect upon A, your decision as to what you want to do professionally, whether it's helped crystallize your ideas about what you might want to do, or it's altered in any way your previous plans as to what you might want to do, uh, uh, if, if at all, either one of those two. And secondly, uh, what type of effect what you've learned in the course so far will have upon the actual profession that you want to undertake? Is there anything, because I mean, I, I'm assuming that what you've learned here in the first part of the course is rather surprising to you uh, it's not something you've been told before. It's not anything that any of your educators have shared with you prior to this time. And so that because of the nature of it, I would assume, not necessarily so, and you can say so if it's true, but I would assume that it would have some kind of a profound effect upon you in how you think you might go about doing your profession, ranging all the way from being a high school history teacher you know, to being a, a lawyer or working for any type of a government agency or anything that you might be interested in doing, that it would seem that, uh, that what you have learned so far in the course would have some sort of significant impact uh, upon how you go about practicing that particular profession. Uh, because if it does, if it hasn't, then I'm going to have to crank it up considerably here for the second half 
and tell you a whole bunch of stuff that I wasn't even going to tell you. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, so that, that's, a, uh, that's a, uh, a prompt for... Yeah, for so she didn't tell us more. No, no, that's a... That's a the, no, this, that uh, you, you've gotten a good deal of, of the information. And what we're, we're going to do uh, following up on all of this is that we're going to proceed through uh, from this, this decision on the part of these, two, these, these S-Force people that they'd want to kill the president into unfolding what it is that happened in the more current part of history, uh, having to do with the assassination of the president and the investigation of it. In the, uh, in the hearings that the United States Congress held as a result of that about the criminal activities of the CIA and in this cabal behind it. Uh, we'll get to all of that, but uh, I, I want us to kind of take a, a view at this, this part of the, this point in the course to focus on this paper uh, to, that would help you in your kind of planning your additional educational uh, process in your profession. Okay, so, the, so now, ha, ha, what are some really interesting and stimulating questions that you guys have got about all this? Well, so this is getting a little bit off topic, but... Um, well, that's not a good introduction for the, but I'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll go with it. This has absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about, but, I mean, uh, okay. So you were talking about how Nixon, um, like one of the things I think of is Nick, uh, like associated with Nixon is like the start of the war on drugs. Mm. And you're uh, saying that he, you know, was involved in like heroin smuggling in yes. the country. Yeah. So I'm wondering what his, the goal of, what your opinion about like the goal of the war on drugs yeah. was. Like, it's a variation on your first question, right? What in the world would they be doing something like this for? The answer to that is, I'll, I'll give you a, I, this story that we were talking about the other day, that what happened is uh, later on in history, there was a, an investigation that was mounted by the United States uh, executive branch, the Justice Department, looking into these accusations that the mafia was skimming cash off the casinos in Vegas that belonged to them in that they were using this cash for certain types of criminal activities. They weren't sure what the full scale of that was, so they, there was a five agency interagency task force that was assigned to investigate this, and it was codenamed Operation Croupier. Uh, Croupier being the person who skims all the chips and everything off the table and takes all the money. So it was codenamed Operation Croupier. It was headed up by a fellow in the Justice Department by the name of Michael Shaheen. And they began this investigation. That's how they found out about how they were skimming the money and they were putting it in these Cadillac cars and driving it around. And, uh, and uh, I got told all about this by Carl Schloffler. Carl Schloffler was the head of the Organized Crime Strike Force in Washington, D.C. and was the head of the team that actually arrested everybody in the Watergate Hotel. That was he. And he was telling me all about this investigation. And they, they followed all this money around and they got down to the Miami National Bank. They tracked it to the International Credit Bank in Geneva, Switzerland. And one of the lines of money coming out of this, uh, these accounts was going to this strange account other than the Ogario account. This was an account uh, that was in the name of a man by the name of Lucien Conin. And it turns out that Lucien Conin was coincidentally inside the DEA. And not coincidentally, it turned out that he was an assassin. And he was the guy that actually led the team that assassinated Neo Dinh Diem in Vietnam back in November of 1963. But uh, so Lucien Conin was the head of this five-man group inside the DEA, all of whom were professional assassins that were part of the uh, were part of the Operation Phoenix in South Vietnam. And so Michael Shaheen looked at this and he said, "Holy shit! What is this?" You know, what, what, is, what is this operation inside the DEA? And it turns out that it was an assassination squad. And what they were doing is they were assassinating the competitors of the cocaine cartel that was being used to help finance covert operations for Operation Condor. And so now you know what the war on drugs was about. The war on drugs was to suppress the competitors of the line of drug smuggling that was going on that was financing their covert operations. Okay. Anything more? We've still, we've still got like six whole minutes. Um, how do you think this um, particular part about like, during the, the missile crisis would have gone if um, Nixon would have been elected? In the, in the 
oh, if, 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 Nixon, if Nixon had been elected, he would have sent in the United States Marines uh, to invade Cuba, and uh, they would have gone in, and they would have been able to apply enough military force to, to topple the government uh, there. They would have put in a new puppet government like Batista, and all of the previous organizing that had been done by Fidel Castro and everyone else would still be in place, and then there would have been a, a protracted process by means of which they would have overthrown the new government that was put in there by the United States because it would have been a replay of Batista. They would have reinstigated the heroin trafficking. They would have re reopened the casinos and the houses of prostitution. They would have done all of that. And it may have set back this whole process by another 10, 15 years. But then it would have replayed itself back out again because they weren't going to, the, one of the things that they haven't seemed to learn the lesson of is you cannot go into a foreign country and occupy it and do it successfully. You know, the people are going to organize and mobilize and they're gonna throw your ass out. Uh, you know, and you, you can bring in as many military people and garrisons and stuff as you want, but the fact of the matter is the people are not going to allow that to happen. You know, and there's enough people around the world that will participate and be supportive of what the, the Cuban people were gonna do is that they would have thrown them out of there. So in my opinion, it would have just set back the clock maybe 10 years maybe 15, and then that would have replayed itself all out again. Yeah. Cruz just dropped out. Cruz did? What? Oh, because he's getting wiped out today, it's right? like 52 to 36. Yeah, okay, good. Well, died. goodbye, Cruz. <laughs> goodbye. There he goes. Such a sweetheart. Such a, <laughs> such a, such a charmer, uh, you know? It's going to break a lot of hearts, him and his wife's. Uh, <laughs> So, so anyway, so, so, so there goes Cruz. How, how, how are they doing on the, uh, uh, have they gotten, what are the numbers coming in on uh, Bernie and Hillary? So with 55.9% reporting, Sanders 52%, Clinton 47. Yes. Wow. Not bad so far, not bad so far. But it's only 55%, big cities uh, are not in yet? Probably not. Probably not. We'll see. Okay, so uh, let's, pardon? Yes? Yep. Okay. So anyway, uh, you're all excused, so you can go home now and follow the numbers. Okay? And then I'll see, I'll see you guys on Thursday. Okay? Danny, is Ted Cruz's dad in that picture? We're not sure yet. I, I, we got to check it out.